Per capita GDP in Mississippi overtook the UK. Ontario inhabitants are now poorer per capita than inhabitants of Mississippi, and that's the poorest American state. That is exactly what Europe's economy GDP is still where it was in 2009. Cost of living is also a lot lower, though. So I haven't and the economies don't grow. My favorite statistic right now is that if the UK, France, or Germany joined the United States as the 51st state, it would become the poorest state in the Union, poorer than even Mississippi. Send this to your Europeans to remind them who the real hillbillies are. I'm sorry, but are we really suggesting that countries like Spain, Italy, France, places with piazzas, sculpted marble, high-tech public transportation, and excellent centers of education and research are poorer than Mississippi? No offense to Mississippi, but come on now. Measuring a country's gross domestic product per capita and comparing it to the US has made for some pretty emotionally charged headlines over the years. From Australia to the United Kingdom, Germany to Canada, wealth and relative poverty are clear concerns, and GDP per capita is often used as a metric for gauging overall economic opportunities. But what is GDP per capita actually measuring? What is it good at telling us? What is it not so great about telling us about the relative wealth and well-being of workers within a country? And is there a better metric that could give us insights onto the health of global economies? Well, let's take a look. Before we can make statements like this headline from Euronews, statisticians and economists must try to solve an important problem. How do we compare the prosperity of two countries with different economies, different standards of living, and different currencies? There are a few ways to analyze a country's wealth and prosperity, but GDP, or gross domestic product per capita, is overwhelmingly the most universal because its components are regularly tracked on a global scale, providing ease of calculation and usage. The basic formula for calculating GDP is to divide the gross domestic product or the total monetary value of all goods and services produced within a country during a specific time period, usually a year, by the number of people living in the country during that time. The reason this is such an important indicator is that higher economic output is usually associated with higher household incomes. In other words, when an economy generates more value per person per year, that typically translates into more money for those working in that economy. Higher incomes mean families can spend more on the things they value. They can afford groceries and rent without financial stress, get the dental care they need, send their children to university, and maybe even take a family vacation. It also typically means that governments have a greater capacity to provide public services, such as education, healthcare, and other social assistance programs. As a result, higher GDP per capita is often associated with positive outcomes in a wide range of areas, such as better health, more education, and even greater life satisfaction. And so in this regard, GDP per capita definitely gets used as kind of a catch-all when we talk about relative wealth and prosperity from one place to another. And specifically when we look here in Europe, there are reasons to ring the alarm when it comes to GDP per capita trends that we've seen over the last few decades. Since 2008, nominal US GDP has outpaced that of the European Union to the point that the EU is now just two thirds of the economy that the US is, rather than a prior near parity. But these aren't reasons for American triumphalism, let alone reasons to claim that America is somehow unfathomably wealthier than other European nations. Though it is tempting to use GDP per capita as an all-encompassing measurement of prosperity, it doesn't tell us the full story. For instance, though GDP per capita is an indirect measure of average income, it doesn't necessarily mean that the typical person in that economy earns this amount. In U.S. states like Mississippi, GDP per capita tends to be much higher than the average income because of the tremendous value generated by their capital-intensive manufacturing, finance, insurance, and real estate industries. GDP per capita here is $53,872, but the per capita income is just $30,529. To keep continuity in our analysis here for comparison, we do not see that same discrepancy in Germany, where the GDP per capita is $54,343, and the average income per person is adjusted to $54,718. 
The other big issue with GDP per capita is that it's often used as a kind of metric for measuring wealth. But again, that's also not entirely accurate. Consider two people with equal salaries, but one has $1 million in the bank and is adding to it, while the other has just $6,000 in the bank and is spending more than he or she earns. Nations, too, can overspend from savings and rack up enormous debt, but GDP tells us nothing about the size of the stock they have to draw from or their debt obligations. It merely measures the income flow. So the U.S., for reference, has staggering national debt of $106,110 per person. Germany, in contrast, was just €30,930 per person. The U.S. hasn't had a balanced budget, meaning a match between what the government spends and its revenue, since 2001, when Bill Clinton left office. Meanwhile, prioritizing a mostly balanced budget, or a debt break as we call it in Germany, is legally binding for federal and state governments. Now before you come at me in the comment sections, yes of course, there are exceptions to this, and this has caused a lot of political turmoil here in Germany. But generally speaking, I find that politicians here in Germany are much more conscious about the debt that the nation takes on and what it will ultimately mean for future generations that are going to be responsible for paying it back. Moreover, in narrowly focusing in on income, GDP per capita leaves out the value of leisure and enjoying the life you worked hard for. This can distort our conception of the relative flourishing of countries. For instance, while the U.S. GDP per capita is roughly 15% higher than the Netherlands, American workers work 26% more hours than their Dutch counterparts. Which country do you think is happier? Or spends more time on vacations? Or gets to spend more time bonding with their children? It's not the United States. Also, keep in mind that GDP per capita can also be severely skewed by low tax environments. Take Ireland, for example. The country regularly makes the global top 10 for GDP per citizen. However, its real-world wealth is modest in European terms. You see, Ireland's GDP is principally distorted by the presence of more than 1,500 multinationals. Among them, most of the world's top tech, pharma, and aviation leasing firms primarily because of the country's status as a tax haven. Just take a look at what happened in 2015 when Ireland posted a gravity-defying 26% gain in GDP, the highest ever recorded in post-war Europe. Why? Well, the majority of that gain reflected Apple's decision that year to shift its intellectual property assets to an Irish domicile. The IMF calculated in 2018 that a quarter of Ireland's GDP growth could be attributed to global sales of iPhones, with the other Apple units paying the Irish unit to use its IP. But those phones didn't change the day-to-day -day quality of life or economic opportunity of the average Irish man or woman. The quality of life remained unchanged from the year prior. The most glaring issue, however, with calculations around GDP per capita is that they don't take into account income inequality. After all, the big issue with averages is that if the pool is skewed significantly to one side, it can really distort the final result that you get. Imagine two countries with the same national income. In the first, 40% of the country's income goes to the top 10%. In the second, 20% does. The latter country has much more income to go around to the vast majority of its citizens, and the aggregate well-being is likely to be higher. And this is something that is especially bad in the United States. In the past 60 years, America witnessed a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the wealthiest families, increasing wealth inequality. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! In 1963, the wealthiest family had 36 times the wealth of families in the middle of the wealth distribution. By 2022, they had 71 times the wealth of families in the middle. And over the past three decades, America's most affluent families have added to their net worth while those on the bottom have dipped into negative wealth, meaning the value of their debts exceed the value of their assets. Which is the literal definition of the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And don't get me wrong, other countries too have experienced widening wealth inequalities. However, no other similarly wealthy nation has done it bigger and better than the United States. For much of modern history, rich countries tended to have lower income inequality than developing countries. After all, wealthy countries shouldn't have large swaths of their population living in abject poverty. 
However, over the past few decades, the U.S. has risen to be an outlier amongst wealthy nations, not necessarily because of inequality and injustice at the bottom, but outrageous opulence at the top. But to understand this picture further, I want to hit pause for a second and introduce another metric that I think helps to complete the picture that GDP per capita is often trying to paint. The Gini coefficient or Gini index is the most commonly used measure of inequality. Developed by Italian statistician Corrado Gini, it measures inequality on a scale from zero to one, where higher values indicate higher inequality. A value of zero indicates perfect equality. Everyone has the same income. A value of one indicates perfect inequality, where one person receives all of the income and everyone else receives nothing. We can use this metric to create something called the Lorenz curve, a visual representation of how far a country falls from perfect equality. In a population where income is shared perfectly equally, the Lorenz curve would be a straight diagonal line. 10% of the population would earn 10% of the total income, 20% would earn 20% of the total income, and so on and so forth. This line of equality is shown here on your screen. However, if we were to create a hypothetical population that was not so equal, perhaps where the bottom 60% of the population only earns 30% of the total income, the Lorenz curve falls, as shown. But the Gini coefficient doesn't tell us the full story either, as illustrated when we take this from a hypothetical example into the real world. For example, as you see here, South Africa is, by this measure, the most unequal country in the world with a Gini index of 0.63. On the other hand, it still has roughly twice the median income of Guinea. The Gini index measures inequality within a country, but it doesn't take into account the country's overall wealth, which is where GDP per capita that I paused on earlier re-enters this conversation. When we plot on a graph the Gini coefficient on the y-axis and the GDP per capita on the x-axis for all of the countries globally, you get this. Note the size of the circles visually represents the population of those countries. On the bottom right, we have countries that are wealthy and experience low income inequality, such as Norway and the Netherlands. On the top left, we have countries which experience widespread poverty, as well as highly unequal societies, such as Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. An obvious outlier from the pack is the United States. For a country with moderately high wealth per capita, it experiences higher income inequality than all of its peers. And when we plot these values over time, we can see that while, yes, in fact, GDP per capita is high and it's growing, that wealth is being highly concentrated in the hands of just a very few, with little to no benefit to the typical average American family. And just in case you are wondering, yes, there has been calculations of the Gini coefficient on a state-by-state -state basis in the United States. And wouldn't you know it, Mississippi is, in fact, a highly unequal income state, just as predicted. Now hear me out. The U.S. can still be a really great place to live and work, particularly if you have a really great potential for wealth accumulation, whether that comes from inherited wealth, whether that's in the form of a high-paying job where you can accumulate that wealth over time, or with the potential of a nice education where you can get that amount of wealth in the future. America is, after all, known as the land of opportunity. And I'm sure there will be many young Americans in the comment section of my video that are going to counter everything I've said thus far and say, yeah, well, at my job in the United States, I can make double what I would make in Europe. And to be fair, you're not wrong. However, just as the United States has been known as the land of opportunity, the risk of failure has also never been higher there. Personal debt is at an all-time high. Families are having less children, in part due to financial concerns. And compared to most European counterparts, Americans have less of a financial safety net and significantly lower worker protections. Plus, it's normal in American culture to have to beg for donations in order to have the basic level of protection offered to citizens in most other similarly wealthy countries. 
GoFundMe doesn't exist where I live here in Germany. The idea that I would have to beg my friends and family for money so that I can take time off of work to help care for an ill child or to cover my medical expenses or to take off maternity leave greater than six weeks is absurd. I'm not saying that European economies don't face issues of wage stagnation, cost of living, or international economic competition. There are real concerns here on how aging populations will impact our ability to offer robust social protections. But while our conversations here in Europe are revolving around how we continue paying for these services, Americans are still trying to figure out how to do it in the first place. And here's the thing, at the end of the day, strong communities are not built by removing the guardrails. And it constantly surprises me on just how many Americans don't see that the issues plaguing their communities, like violence, poor educational opportunities, affordable housing shortages, crumbling infrastructure, and chronic illness epidemics, aren't exactly the product of economic policy choices that they have made along the way. And as a society, we all benefit from raising the collective quality of life, not lowering the burden of social contribution. And what calculations like GDP per capita and the Gini coefficient together illustrate for me is that wealth accumulation amongst the top 1% don't equate to a better quality of life for the average person. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this subject below. Obviously, discussions around GDP per capita and quality of life really get some people emotionally charged. And comparing where you have the best opportunity is a serious conversation that so many of us have. So I would love to hear your thoughts down below in the comment section on this topic, as well as maybe a discussion on how you feel these things have shifted over time because these issues obviously aren't stagnant. So again, let me know your thoughts down below. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.